I'm joined today by Stavros Kavouras, a professor and director of the Hydration Science Lab at the University of Arkansas. His lab is studying the mechanisms by which water intake affects health and performance. Dr. Kavouras is the author of more than 100 peer-reviewed articles and has given lectures in 28 countries, as well as being a fellow of the American, Co American College of Sports Medicine and the European College of Sports. Stavros, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate the invitation. It's always a pleasure talking about hydration. Well, yeah, I think that's a great place to kick things off is how did you get interested in hydration and hydration research? Uh, I was always in my family, I was the person that will drink a tremendous amount of water. So everybody was making, uh, in quotes, fun of me that, uh, that I, I was always thirsty, I guess. This is uh, probably a little bit on, a, on my background, but the thing uh, scientifically, I should uh, give the credit to Dr. Armstrong, who was my professor in, uh, and my mentor in the University of Connecticut, where I did my PhD, that uh, he really got me extremely excited in the topic. And this is how I got involved with research on hydration. Incredible. Well, can you give everyone a little brief introduction to the topic of hydration, perhaps a little bit of a historical perspective here to kick things off? Sure. Um, and, and paying attention, actually, uh, there are many things that we can approach that. And I know the interest is primarily during exercise and exercise performance. Um, if we go back probably 60, 70, 80 years ago, uh, at the same almost time in the 40s and 50s, there were separate group of scientists, one of them um, trying to show that, you know, drinking during exercise is probably not bad for you. You can drink, you can drink before exercise, and probably you won't find negative effects on exercise performance. And, and if you go and search those studies, what is interesting, I, I like the wording, and sometimes I copy or I screenshot pieces of the papers and I use them in my lectures, where the wording sounds like uh, drinking before exercise, it doesn't really have negative effect. Uh, on exercise performance. So the hypothesis was, let's do this study to prove that if you drink, you're really going to ruin your performance. And they had even a sequence of potential mechanisms that is going to, the stomach fullness is going to squeeze your diaphragm, which is one of the major respiratory muscles, and on and on. And this is going to be so bad for you and, and you know, many different things. Wow. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if you look like uh, the, the studies, and there is a whole book dedicated on this, is Physiology of Man and Desert by um, um, Adolf, uh, he had a lot of observations about how drinking during exercise, and, and back then they didn't have heat chambers that we use today to do really controlled experiments. He will go to uh, warm places like in Nevada in, in deserts, and he will take people and they will walk and they will measure body temperature, etc. He starts showing that if you exercise and you don't drink, your body temperature rises, you get tired, and on and on and on. So from one side in the historic aspect in the 40s, there were data showing that drinking during exercise is good for you. And from the other side, people trying to prove that drinking is so bad for you. But study after study starts showing that probably it's not bad. You can drink and exercise. <laughs> and I also remember me as being an athlete. I used to be a, a competitive swimmer when I was growing up in Greece. Um, our coach will not let us drink. Uh, he will, of course, let us wear, uh, you know, windproof uh, clothing in the middle of the summer and exercise and do like dry land training and, and you know, early in the, sure. in the fall. And, and whoever dared to drink water will get punished uh, with extra laps. And, and uh, I remember also hearing stories of professional soccer players in Europe getting fined significant amount of money because they dared to drink water. And that was not 50 years ago. That was only maybe 20 to 30 years ago. So, so I think we have made big progress and we've done a lot of changes uh, at least on, on the topic of drinking during exercise or around exercise before, after, and during exercise and how drinking improves exercise performance. And on that note, in terms of getting recommendations, I mean, obviously when you have, you know, big teams or organizations, we give these generalized recommendations. And of course, when we work with, with athletes, especially in a one-to-one, -one, then the ideal is to give individualized guidelines. You know, what, what's the, the reality there in terms of being able to individualize the hydration for each athlete? Is that, is that really the optimal strategy? 
this is where sports nutrition moves in general. Uh, so we're talking more of how to address individually the athlete and not one size fit all. Uh, however, I'll tell you this, my experience is that there is a lot of resistance when we go down to individual approach. For some reason, everybody wants to give one size fit all approach, which it doesn't work. It doesn't work in anything. How come it will work for sports nutrition or for hydration? Uh, you know, we don't make one car. And if you want to buy a car, you go and you buy one car. We make like <laughs> gazillions of cars and you have options. And when you're when you're an athlete and you're looking for a pair of running shoes, you don't go and buy the blue Nikes size nine and a half. You buy the one that really is made for your feet. Exactly. You, know, you you get your own size. Teams do not buy one size and everybody wears the same size, no matter if you have a bigger or smaller foot. How come in nutrition we have to, to give an advice that will work for absolutely everybody? It's gonna work for the weekend warrior, it's gonna work for the you know, for the professional athlete and for the golden Olympian. So, so I think it's a little bit uh, of approach and how much we uh, value sports nutrition and how much we value hydration and whether we are truly convinced that it's going to help to improve performance and also maintain uh, health and safety for the athletes, which is also a very important topic that we tend to forget. Absolutely. Maybe we could even circle back here for, for folks who are, uh, tuning in, whether it's trainers, nutritionists, even docs, you know, you know what's really the technical definition of dehydration? Uh, dehydration, actually, it's, it's, it's quite complicated because many times I, when I teach classes or when we design experiments, I talk to my students, I'm like, is that really dehydration? So technically, dehydration is the deficit of total body water. So somehow, even though we don't have a, a widely accepted cutoff, or, or what it means to be dehydrated, but you have to have a water deficit. So if you talk in a clinical perspective, uh, usually you have to have, if you talk to a cl clinician or to a physician who works in the ICU, et cetera, they're talking about 5% of body weight as dehydration, which is relatively mild. In, in exercise performance, when you lose 5% of body weight, it makes a difference of being the best in the world or being maybe a little bit better than high school athletes. Wow. So it can really destroy your exercise performance, 5% decrease in body weight. So, but in general, it's widely accepted that dehydration is decrease in total body water. This is what it means, dehydration. Uh, what is interesting that, that, you know, most people don't argue with that, uh, dehydration could be something else as well. So I'll give you an example. We all know that we cannot hydrate with seawater. So if I make you drink a, a significant amount of seawater, which is super salty, very high osmolality, then what do you do to your body? Most people will agree that you're dehydrating your body, but on the same time, you increase your body water, right? For sure. So, so dehydration, I mean, the definition, it is decreasing total body water, but, but it's a little bit more complicated. So the example of drinking salt water or, or very, very salty water, it's, it's probably a good example to understand or to get convinced that dehydration is not only when you lose body water. And for the athletes listening in there, in terms of the mechanisms, you know, when they get into this two to three to four or five percent dehydration and we're seeing performance decrements, what's going on behind the scenes in terms of mechanisms that's um, contributing to that lack of performance? Uh, uh, there are two things that happen with dehydration. So probably the primary factor that has detrimental effect on exercise performance is associated with decrease in water in the blood, what we call decrease in plasma water or plasma volume, or technically we use the term hypovolemia. So when plasma volume, when water content from the blood specifically decreases, blood becomes more concentrated, more viscous. And, and also the, the, the big issue is when blood volume decreases, then your cardiovascular system is not working very effectively. So what athletes really see in the day-to-day -day training or performance in games, et cetera, especially when we talk about endurance events, uh, we see higher heart rate, we see uh, onset of fatigue uh, setting uh, much faster, much easier, 
And little by little, as the dehydration progresses during exercise, then you see more decrements. But but the main or, or the first um, causality, I would say, on the decrement in exercise performance is associated with the decrease in plasma volume. The other thing that happens is we get concentration of blood, of blood and that concentration in blood, what we call uh, osmolality or, or hypertonicity, um, what happens, some receptors get activated, the osmoreceptors get activated, and that itself also has an effect on how your cardiovascular system works, how your body perceives thermoregulation, your ability to sweat and regulate temperature. So you also see, other than higher heart rate and cardiovascular strain, you also see higher body temperature, you start feeling hotter than usual. And, and actually, if you read in the literature carefully, for every uh, degree of, of uh, for every percent of dehydration, you find a significant increase in your body temperature during exercise. So, so it's you can really predict it very accurately to see based on how much you lose, how much your body temperature is going to go up. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Amazing how complex all the systems are there, the checks and balances, and you know, for endurance athletes versus let's say uh, team or strength force sport athletes, is there a, is there a difference there to a group that might be more predisposed than, than another? Um, usually endurance athletes are more sensitive because of the nature of the sports, uh, for strength, for, for, for endurance athletes, actually, we do have data that they're coming out of, of my lab and, and other labs, actually, from, uh, from Europe and from Canada, actually, um, indicating that even a mild percent of dehydration, we have shown repeatedly that even just a little bit over 1% of body weight dehydration, it shows detrimental effect in performance. And this is for endurance type of exercise, even in intense exercise like cycling or running. Um, if you go to strength like weightlifting and power output and, and jumping, etc., cetera, then uh, the threshold that you start seeing in permanent exercise performance, it's a, it's a little bit higher. So typically you need at least 3% of, of water deficit before you start seeing decrements in strength and explosiveness, et cetera. Um, talking about team sports, um, a lot of, of the team sports, they have very strong endurance component, like basketball, for example, or soccer. Um, and, and this thing, there have been several studies showing, you know, they do simulation of, of the nature of the sport with specific tests. But what is interesting, there was a study, there were two studies, actually, that they were published um, a few years ago, it must have been probably seven or eight years ago from Penn State University by Larry Kenny's lab, where he used basketball specific techniques, not looking at their ability to run in the court or to get a rebound, but their ability to score, their ability to do drills that they are very close to the nature of the game of basketball. And they saw that from 2% on, you have decrement in your ability to make a bucket, your ability to dribble well, the ability to run around quickly. So, so even in team sports, um, it seems that water deficit, um, at least we know that 2% um, in Paris exercise performance and, and not the classic get in the treadmill and run, even making, you know, free throws uh, could have an effect. Yeah, it's really interesting stuff because, um, you know, I've seen some research on NBA teams and professional basketball around, you know, the amount of dehydration that's so common, especially by the end of games. So um, as you mentioned there, it seems pretty key for a lot of the, the skill aspects, especially as the game gets later, to really be able to maintain hydration. Uh, but it also sounds like there's a bit of wiggle room for strength sport athletes, as you mentioned there, in terms of that uh, percent dehydration and its impact on uh, on performance. Now, now, what about heat? If athletes, especially endurance athletes, having to train in heat, how does that add to the mix of, of hydration and the importance of hydration? In general, when we exercise, we have the internal heat that we produce, what we call metabolic heat production. So you exercise, you start sweating um, in most environments, unless it is extremely, extremely cold outside. So on the top of the internal metabolic heat production that your body is going to sweat to eliminate heat, you have the, the, the external environment. So uh, the dehydration in combination with exposure in a hot environment I think it's one of the most stressful and most complicated situations for human body 
and especially for the cardiovascular system. So what is happening from one side, your body's trying to sweat a lot in order to be able to dissipate heat and thermoregulate effectively because if you get too hot, you can have com heat um, illnesses and, and heat complications. And on the other side, you need enough uh, water in your body to be able to maintain stroke volume and cardiac output and your body be able to push oxygen and nutrients to the active muscles. So it's a, it's a very uh, stressful situation for your body when it's trying to balance thermoregulation from one side oxygen delivery and nutrient uh, delivery at the same time to be able to to uh, to exercise there are a lot of studies that have been done throughout the years indicating that heat on its own impairs exercise performance especially for endurance events and we also know that dehydration on its own declines exercise performance when you combine them together then you have an additive effect and both of them um, they contribute to a greater uh, impairment in exercise performance. So I would say dehydration and heat at the same time is a, is a, a stressful situation and it's something that we have to be very careful uh, and plan accordingly uh, when we have athletes train and compete in this kind of environments. Yeah, absolutely, especially as we you know, gear up for another round of Summer Olympics in a few years' time. But uh, another thing I wanted to ask you, Stavros, around the sweating is, is something that players will often ask me in terms of, you know, of some guys who their jerseys are, you know, you get all the white marks on the, on the jerseys where other guys, not so much. So what's the difference here in sweat rates and salty sweaters versus sweaters who aren't so salty? Okay. Uh, the, the marks on, on, on dark clothes is, uh, an indication that you're losing a lot of electrolytes, a lot of primarily sodium. We're talking around sodium because this is probably the most important, um, electrolyte that plays a significant role in, in water regulation and in cramping and in performance, etc. Um, so th some people, for reasons that we are not very clear, uh, they tend to lose more sodium from their sweat and what we call salty sweaters than others. And that could be uh, a three to four fold difference between people. Uh, obviously, you don't know if you are a salty sweater unless you see very significant marks in your clothes or if you do a specific testing, which is not that difficult. Actually, you need a professional to collect the samples with a specific technique and then take them and analyze them in a laboratory. But if you do have especially symptoms like cramping and light uh, lightheadedness during exercise, etc., it's something that you can test and identify whether you are one of those um, salty sweaters. On the other side, we have people that they are what we call heavy sweaters, people that they exercise and they lose a lot of um, a lot of water, they sweat a lot. This is very easy to assess. Just measure how much water you lose uh, in a practice. You can exercise for an hour. If the weather is not very hot, you can once refrain from drinking water for an hour. So make your calculations easy. See the changes in your body weight. You take your body weight without clothes before and after. And based on how much body weight you lose, which is almost 100% water, uh, you can get an idea of how much you sweat per hour. Athletes, an average athlete exercising at very high intensity in a warm environment can lose as much as two liters per hour. Uh, however, there, there, are, there are athletes that they have been losing way more than that. And probably the one um, case study that was published uh, almost 40 years ago uh, by Larry Armstrong, um, it was based on Alberto Salazar, uh, you know, a little bit controversial name by now, I guess, for <laughs> obvious reasons uh, with Nike. But uh, he was a, a phenomenal athlete and he had the world record in marathon back in the day in the 1983-84 where his sweating rate was close to four liters per hour. That's insane, it isn't it? Ab it's absolutely insane. And unfortunately, there is, you know, your GI, your, your gastrointestinal system cannot, it's not designed to be able to cope this, with this kind of dehydration. So you cannot drink enough. You cannot drink four liters per hour, even if you lose that much. It, it's, your, your system is not going to absorb it. So... When you're such a super heavy sweater, it's very difficult to perform well in in hot environments. And obviously, in his case, he was competing in Los Angeles Olympics in the marathon, which he didn't do very well, even though he did everything 
scientifically possible to, to thermoacclimatize and get ready for that event. Uh, pick a cooler city. I mean, you cannot pick, you cannot change the Olympics, but if you want to run a race, you know, a, a marathon race, pick a race which is in a colder place, maybe close to the winter and not in the summer. But it, you were born like that. It's very difficult to change your sweating rate uh, if you're a very heavy sweater. So those things are things that can be identified and based on your um, sweat losses and electrolyte losses, you can have really individualize uh, rehydration during exercise and potentially overall during the day to have really good hydration state. Yeah, you mentioned a great method there of assessment in terms of just body weight before and after exercise. And I know for a lot of our players at Canada Basketball, there's a lot of differences between individuals. Um, are there other methods of assessment in terms of gold standard um, or even general practical methods, things like color of the urine or specific gravity that... Uh, that, that folks or docs or clinicians, practitioners could could use or think about using? For, for athletes, I think the body weight changes is is the gold standard uh, for percent of dehydration. Um, and if you're careful, you have to be, you have to correct for how much you drink during practice and how much you pee. So you really see exactly how much you sweat corrected for the amount that you drink during practice. Uh, this is also a very good educational tool for athletes because they do not understand how much they lose. And this is also, this is work that has been published and has been shown before that during exercise, people do not understand how much they lose. So just do it even in some practices to see how much you weigh, how much water you lose before and after practice. It's, it's a very strong message for the athletes, you know, you're not drinking enough during practice. And there are studies after studies after studies showing that when athletes drink on their own, they rarely drink more than 60 or 50% of what they lose. So they really develop uh, exercise induced, what we call exercise induced dehydration as a response, as a response to exercise or training. And, and uh, uh, as, oops, go on. I'm sorry. Uh, as far as uh, biomarkers that you mentioned, urine osmolality or urine color, etc., uh, those are good indications overall. I mean, you can use them throughout the day. Dark urine means that your body has, uh, it, your body is producing antidiuretic hormone to a significant amount, which is a hormone that is designed to decrease water wasting. So when you're running low in water, antidiuretic hormone increases, and what you see as a response is concentrated dark urine. So if you're not going to the bathroom often, or when you go to the bathroom, if the urine is very, very concentrated, those are both indications that you're not drinking enough. But the body weight before and after practice, when we talk specifically for athletes, I think it's the best way to get an idea how much you drink during exercise, and also gives you an idea how much you have to drink when you finish to be able to recover. And all things being equal, Stavros, if an athlete, let's say, lost four pounds of water in a in a training session, and they weren't, uh, they didn't go to the bathroom, they weren't drinking anything. Is there, you know, an overarching recommendation that you would give or that you find in your lab for rehydrating in that uh, for the rest of the day? Uh, th there is one thing that we have to uh, clarify. Uh, j just to avoid from people getting the wrong message. So what you lose, I, I like to use it as a guideline to design of what they're supposed to drink during exercise to avoid dehydration. So uh, they can adjust what they're supposed to drink during exercise so they don't finish workout with such a massive deficit. On the other side, when we talk about post-exercise dehydration, the big question is whether you do have the need for a rapid rehydration, for a rapid aggressive rehydration protocol. So do you have an afternoon workout in like six, seven, eight hours? Do you compete in the afternoon again? You had a competition in the morning or a hard workout and you have a second workout in the afternoon. So what is your, uh, your target for rehydration? If there is such a, a need for an aggressive rehydration, we recommend to have 150% of what you lost. So if you have lost four pounds, you have to drink six pounds of, of fluids to be able to recover. And also if in those fluids we have sodium, whether you eat something and, and it gives you sodium, it gives you electrolytes, 
through the diet or whether you have electrolytes in your drink that will speed up the process and will uh, help for retaining that water that you're drinking. So, so, but we have to be clear, this 150% it's for aggressive rehydration protocol. It's only after exercise and we never recommend to over drink during exercise. We don't say to anybody to drink 150% of what you lose while you're exercising. That's great to know. Great recommendation. And definitely for those acute sessions, yeah, when it's back to back and athletes having to perform in such a narrow window. And of course, that makes me think of athletes who need to make weight for competitions, you know, boxers, MMA fighters. Uh, you know, what type of risks are going on there when obviously they're, they're on purpose losing a lot of water and then, of course, trying to rehydrate rapidly before the before the event? Um, this is a, a very sensitive topic, and I and I did have over the years several friends that were either boxers, wrestlers, taekwondo athletes, etc. And and recently, my daughter actually uh, is wrestling for her high school, and and you get into that mode of you don't drink anything for the whole day just to make sure you're in the body weight because you're supposed to be very close to your optimal weight but you know something happened if you're if you're over the the limit then you lose the competition so uh, this thing happens and it happens in high school and it happens in college and it happens to professional athletes um which is obviously it's not a good thing and and athletes get into really complicated treatments so they lose a lot of weight, especially athletes that are now they are over the weight limit and they try to lose five, six, seven, ten pounds in one or two days, uh, which is all water weight. And then as soon as they finish, they drink a lot, they take electrolytes. Many of them, they even do IV treatments, which is illegal and, and dangerous to do this kind of treatments. And and we quite often, especially in uh, in professional wrestling or fighting that we see even in, in, in the in the media. We saw recently a video of, of, I think it was an MMA athlete who was trying to get body weight and he could not stand on the scale for about two minutes. He was fighting for two minutes just to stand on the scale because he was so dehydrated, lightheaded and everything. Oh, so the implications, we, we don't really know exactly what is happening. I can tell you that we know by now that repeated bouts of, of significant dehydration in the kidney uh, leads to acute uh, renal injuries, and those acute kidney injuries long term um, can can lead to chronic kidney disease, which is a, a very complicated disease and very dangerous disease and very expensive disease to treat that affects a lot of people. There are more than Ten uh, percent, almost of Americans, so they do develop of older Americans, so they develop chronic kidney disease, and and in some subgroups, actually, we have much higher incidence, like veterans, for example. So, so uh, we don't know exactly what is happening with repeated bouts of dehydration uh, on different systems when we talk about health. Um, I think there is significant amount of evidence indicating that um, kidney health is sacrifice to some extent for long-term health uh but it's something that we should not uh we should not uh, make people do and we should not recommend to do it i mean you have to be prepared and very close to your body weight um in those uh weight classes in different sports and there and there are many sports i mean we think of of wrestling and and boxing and this kind of categories um, in rowing, for example, the lightweight rowing category, it's also weight restricted, and those people are fighting with dehydration the dates before the the race, wow. just to make the weight, and then they compete in this uh, high power, uh, high aerobic demand event at the same time. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, it's, it's such a strain on the bodies for a lot of these athletes have to make weight and. You know, if we actually shift gears here to more recreational athletes and, of course, with, you know, people going into marathons to, to improve their health or to lose some weight and, you know, the drink to thirst mantra sort of um, come back in recent years. Is, is that an effective strategy for the you know, general population who are doing a, something like a building up to a marathon or whatnot? What are the, uh, the pros and cons there? You know what is interesting? It's amazing the number of emails that I get when we get close to a marathon. And most of those emails come the day before the marathon, I get messages. <laughs> a little too late. Later, I get, yes, 
the night before the marathon, they ask me, what should I drink tomorrow? Whether people that I know or random people that they that they find me in Twitter, uh, my handle is Dr. Hydration. And they're like, oh, this guy should know something about hydration. And, and they're asking me the night before, can you think of any marathon runner that is looking for an advice to buy a new pair of shoes the night before a marathon race? Yeah, I don't think so, right? I mean, if I say that to any legit, I mean, not even legit, any recreational runner, like, will you run a marathon if I give you like the most expensive pair of shoes the night before? They'll be like, are you out of your mind? Are you crazy? I have to try them. I have to do this. I have to do that. You know, why do you seek for an advice for a what and how much to drink right before the race? Um, the drinking to thirst is something that it's probably for some people. Okay. Uh, I think the drinking to thirst, actually, it is not okay. And I think it's in many times is the root of the problem. If, if you look at these people that they're drinking well above and beyond of what they're supposed to drink, they're over drinking during races, which is very, very few people and very short percent of the runners. What is common with these people is that they say, I was thirsty. I felt thirsty and I was drinking so much water. So if you wait to get thirsty to drink or if you guide your, your, your drinking based on thirst, you're also running the risk of over drinking. Thirst, I don't think thirst is a good indication of how much you're supposed to drink. And thirst or drinking is not only physiologic. You know, people drink when they see other people drinking. Um, I, I do a lot of cycling actually the last several years. And what is interesting, when we go out with a peloton for a cycling ride, uh, as soon as you see one of the people in the peloton drinking, everybody grabs their water bottle and they start drinking, which is a little bit dangerous as well. <laughs> we have a whole peloton of people looking up, you know, trying to drink <laughs> while you're cycling. But it, it's a behavior. You see other people drinking, you will be drinking. If, if you listen to me and you have water in front of you, you will drink more probably because I talk about hydration. Uh, so it's not only physiologic. There are a lot of factors that influence how thirsty you get and, and when you drink, etc. So it is, I guess, an approach. It's a very, very generic uh, approach. It's an approach that uh, it's a good approach for survival, I will call it. And we have been able to survive for thousands and thousands of years as human beings uh, based on drinking to thirst. But if you're a, an athlete seeking performance, it is not that difficult to design what you really need to drink during exercise. And I'm not talking about going to the, the details of the composition of the drink and the grams of and the milligrams of, of sodium and potassium and magnesium and all these things. I'm talking about the amount of fluids that you need to drink during a during a race. It's not that hard. Just test yourself with a body scale how much water you need. Uh, uh, per hour and you can design what you need you test it once or twice like you do everything else you do your long runs you do everything um, and then you're good to go yeah great great advice and of course i've heard you also mentioned one of the the biggest side effects of hydration is having to go to the bathroom more uh, can you can you touch on how that could be a, a limiting factor for a lot of people in terms of performance it, it is true it is true if you drink too much um especially if you drink too many hypotonic fluids, uh, like plain water, right before the race, uh, that will increase urinary output, which is a good thing for kidney function. You have lower risk of uh, urinary tract infections, so development of kidney stones and all those good things. You know, it's good for your health. But, uh, you know, in combination with a little bit of the anxiety or, or feeling cold before a race, like you're getting ready to run a marathon, the starting line builds up very early. Usually it's a little bit colder in the morning and people tend to pee more naturally anyway. And then you're looking for a bathroom. People don't want to lose their spot in the starting line. So it's there are a lot of complications in, in sports. And, and think of sports like, uh, let's say, uh, cycling, for example, that you are four hours on the bike and you are in a peloton. Uh, imagine the complications that you have to pee while you're riding. 
and how you do that. And and I'm not going to go into details. Don't feel I'm, super comfortable for that four hour ride, do you? <laughs> yeah, but but they do, they do it. They can they can do it while they're cycling. They stay back in the peloton. They do their tricks and and they do whatever they're supposed to do. Uh, but a lot of athletes might refrain from drinking in that fear. So all these things are things that you can practice and you can figure out what works for you and what doesn't work. Like you do absolutely everything else. I mean, I mentioned cycling. I mean, talk to a recreational cyclist and start talking to them about, uh, I don't know, bike tubes or anything, the, the little, you know, the, the little accessory that goes in their bike. They do their own research studies. They go in blogs. They talk about it. They spend a lot of money to buy everything. Absolutely. You know, it doesn't take so much effort to develop your your own protocol that feeds your your uh, your exercise, the, the weather conditions. Um, you, you just have to pay a little bit more attention. Um, obviously, it's not as pretty as a, a, a nice set of uh, a water bottle cages that are out of carbon and cost $90 a pop. Uh, but it's something important. It's going to help you for your exercise performance and your well-being. Yeah, very well said. And, you know, since we're talking about cyclists, is there ever a scenario where being a bit dehydrated could be potentially beneficial? Because I've heard in cycling, um, some people have suggested that being you know, a little bit lighter during climbs could be a good way to perform better. Is that is that myth, reality? Where's the where are we at with that? So there there are two studies in that topic exactly. Actually, there was the first study was uh, from a, an Australian group where they wanted to examine exactly that what you said. So in cycling and climbing, in the climb, in, in among the climbers, they express uh, what it is the power output per kilogram of body weight, and they say I can push for I don't know two hours, five uh, watts per kilogram of body weight, or you know X numbers, different numbers. So if I lose instead of me being able to push more power output, if I lose one or two or three kilos, that ratio is going to increase, so it will make me a better climber. So they go in a great extent to buy lighter bike because bite is part of what you're carrying up the hill uh, and on and on. So the first study did exactly that test and they use a very high speed treadmill where cyclists were, were uh, cycling on a treadmill um, in a laboratory setting. And they found uh, but that small dehydration that you do indeed theoretically could have higher power output per body weight, air, uh, power output per body weight, uh, did not lead to better performance. Actually, it led to a worse exercise performance uh, because the cardiovascular system was less effective. They could not thermoregulate as effectively. Um, then there was another study, actually, that we published, uh, if I remember correct, must have been 2012 or 2013, where we did a real life scenario. So we went to a hill um, it was a study that we did, the data collection in Athens, a hill that there is a traditional climbing race uh, right outside of Athens downtown. And, and we took competitive cyclists, we took uh, 10 cyclists, and we make them run that race, you know, climb that mountain as fast as they could in two uh, separate conditions, one with just minus 1% body water deficit. And we also found that those athletes were performing uh, the it was about five to seven kilometers climb, continuous climb of 8% average. So good, intense climb. We found that they end up competing uh, and they had less performance. They were approximately 30 seconds slower uh, when they did that about wow. 15 minutes climb. And also their body temperature was higher when they were dehydrated, even though they were going slower. That's so you're going slower you're producing less metabolic heat, but your body temperature is even higher. So it doesn't even sound like a good recipe for, for winning, does it? Exactly. So, so what is interesting is real conditions, real athletes, and, and uh, very mild degree of dehydration. Uh, dehydration that you, many times you might not even know that you're in that water deficit. 
That's so interesting. And uh, sort of dovetails into my next question here, which is in terms of preparation. And we talked, you know, training in the heat. And of course, the, the next Summer Olympics in Tokyo is supposed to be a very hot Olympics as well. So it, are there things that athletes can do to help themselves acclimatize or things around the hydration strategy that can help them out? Um, acclimatization is, is the key to success for competition in the heat. People know that for years. Um, I remember in, in 2004 in Athens Olympics, that was a big concern for many athletes. And um, um, I know the, the U.S. Olympic team exercise physiologist, uh, Randy Wilberg, uh, came to Greece way earlier, with, especially with the marathon runners. And uh, actually, right before the marathon, he went for two weeks um, in an island south from Athens, which is even warmer weather. And they stayed there for two weeks for a training camp. And, and he tried to do all the things that we know that seems to help for exercise performance. Uh, there, are many, there are many things. One is acclimatization, obviously, that uh, it improves your body tolerance to, to, to the heat, to the heat load, whether it's environmental heat or even clothing sometimes. Uh, there are other things that we can do like pre-cooling that seems to be an effective treatment. So you can drop your body temperature before you compete in the heat and there are uh, ice vests that people wear just to cool their body down right before. There are other te techniques like drinking uh, ice slurry uh, right before the race, that seems to drop. Dropping your body mm. internal temperature a little bit also might have an effect. Uh, glycerol was for many years one of the things that people were doing to uh, retain some extra water before exercise as, as an overhydration agent. And, and what is interesting with glycerol, uh, for many years got into the prohibited uh, substance list by WADA because it was interfering with uh, some of the analytical um, um, testing that they do, right? Techniques, yeah. testing that they were doing, exactly. And uh, r this year, actually, in, in 2018, as of January of 2018, was again removed from the list of prohibited substances. So athletes can take it if they want to use it as an uh, overhydration agent right before exercise to start with a little positive total body water. And, and that will help you to avoid the, the over urinating during exercise. So, so there are things, I think acclimatization is number one, getting used to it, uh, developing an individualized hydration protocol, I will rank it very high, and, and all the other things that you should test probably, like uh, pre-cooling, whether it is ice slurry, ice uh, jackets, uh, cold water immersion, there are a lot of things that you can do. And, and regarding um, heat acclimatization, it's something that athletes have are using it actually even if they don't compete in the heat there was uh there were a couple studies published a few years ago from uh, uh from from the u.s uh chris minson is the the lead uh, researcher in that team and and his lab uh, they saw that if you do heat acclimatization you have positive effect in endurance type of exercise even if you compete in cold weather it's and incredible. this is probably associated with the fact that when you get heat acclimatized, your body holds more water in your blood. So your plasma volume seems to expand. And then and that gives you much better cardiovascular stability. So so heat acclimatization is good. It should become part of your training. There are many new tricks that you can do. Uh, athletes are using recently the post-exercise hot baths which is the opposite for inflammation, obviously. You know, you remember we're doing the, the ice bathing after exercise too. For sure. For, as a cryotherapy. Uh, but if you do uh, hot water immersion after exercise, that your body sees that in a way as a stimulus to, to in, induce uh, acclimatization. So there are many different ways. There, there are many things. And as years go by, uh, athletes, coaches, and researchers get smarter and they try to figure out ways to make them more effective and easier for the athletes. That's phenomenal stuff. Really, really interesting, uh, all the different applications. And I want to, of course, respect your time here, Stavros. The last couple of quick questions for you. Um, where, what do you think the evolution of, of hydration for athletes in the research? Where are things going in the next five or ten years? I think the evolution is in the individualized, not only hydration, but sports nutrition approach. Um, I, I, I think for now we have enough information that we can really start customize per athlete, their needs, their sport. 
and and have uh, individual approach to to sports nutrition in general. And what I see probably in in the future, probably not in the in immediate future, uh, the the genetic approach be part of it uh, to a good extent. So we can take into consideration genes that might be um, associated with uh, with what you drink and what you eat. I don't think we're there yet. Uh, I don't think we're even close to that yet, to be honest. I know there are companies that they love to do genetic testing for all sorts of things to prove whether you are X, Y, Z athlete and whether you're better for this or that. Um, this might be something that will be applicable in the future, but we don't have the knowledge right now to do this kind of things as of today. But having individualized nutrition right now, we do have this capacity. And at least for hydration, when we know indeed that sweating rate and sweat composition can vary dramatically between athletes, it's, a, it's an easy target. It's an easy way to make an athlete look better and perform better and avoid problems like, you know, uh, problems that you might have during exercise, whether it is uh, heat injuries or whether it is cramping and, and all those things that uh, it's, it's the athlete's worst nightmare. Well, yeah, it's great, uh, great insights and great to, to hear you say, I mean, I'm a big believer in personalized medicine, personalized nutrition. So obviously, uh, as you mentioned, for hydration it seems like a, a, a no brainer. And last question here for you, Stavros, just to kind of wrap things up. Um, you know, if you had to give one piece of advice, I know it's difficult, um, but kind of that uh, 80% uh, big rocks fundamentals for folks in terms of hydration, uh, what uh, tip would that be? I think a very uh, good thing for hydration, both for athletes and for everyday people, is uh, think of hydration every time you go to the bathroom. Uh, look at your urine. If your urine is concentrated, it's an easy way to get an idea whether you need to drink more water. So it, it's very easy. And, and also you can pay attention to how often you go to the bathroom. On the other side, many people might drink too much. You know, if you go to the bathroom every 15 minutes, you know, just slow down. You're overdoing <laughs> it. Uh, we're trying to develop this kind of approach for, for everyday people and um, our, our preliminary data, actually, some of that we have published already, some of that. It seems that if you go to the bathroom under six or seven times uh, per day, so if you don't urinate, if you urinate less than six or seven times per day, it seems that your body needs more water. Uh, so that could be some kind of easy guide. How often you go, and how dark is your urine? Those are two very easy things. It costs nothing. It doesn't take extra time. You know, just think about it. And that could guide you to drink uh, according to your hydration. Phenomenal, Stavros. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out today. It's fantastic to get such you know great insights from a world leader here. So, um, you know, where can people keep up with you on, on social media to keep up with what you're doing and uh, uh, stay connected with you? Um, I'm active in Twitter. My Twitter handle is Dr. Hydration, one word. Um, also Instagram uh, with the same handle, Dr. Hydration, and Facebook. But uh, I think in Twitter is, is the vehicle that they use more often, and I try to share information about new studies, new publications, new insights on the topic. Terrific.